Okay, I want to welcome everyone to another uh, another Lighthouse Project class on the Zoom platform. Tonight is going to be the final installment in this mini series called The Hidden Agenda. <clears throat> this is a, just so we we know how you know how, how we got here. Um, if you pay attention to the weekly tour portion that we're reading the past few weeks, the, 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 the content inside the parashiyot was just jumping out at me saying, hey, whatever is happening in the desert is actually happening right now. It's today's headlines. And we took a lot of time, a lot of time to, uh, to point out, you know, the different groups of people that we were dealing with, the different types of um, uh, uh, trials, the different types of tests, the different uh, agendas that were uh, being put out there, the hidden agendas, and we saw a lot of different examples. And uh, I think we also were able to make a nice parallel between some of uh, the, the current events that we're experiencing. And we're seeing, like the, like Shema Merev said, En Chadash Mitachat Hashamish. There's nothing new uh, under the sun. Everything, everything is uh, everything has been here before. Nothing is new, everything is being renewed. So as we put in our last installment of this uh, class, which is called the scapegoat and uh, the sheepish masses and the scapegoat, I'd like to first get dedicate the class to the Elu Nishmat of Menachem Mendel Ben Elchanan, Devor Fido Bat Shmuel, David Ben Zohara, Shmuel Ben Anmuma, Yaniv Ben Rina, Tzion Ben Zechariah, Rav Ezra Labaton, Sarah Ita Ben Shmuel, Abraham and Freddy Ben Moshe, Mordechai Aaron Ben Zev, and Daniel Ben Juna. Also, I'd like to give uh, some honorable mentions and some blessings. Itbarach Shemo Shel Kadosh Baruch Hu, may Itbal Ben Jacqueline, Bat Chel Ben Jacqueline, Yehuda Lev Ben Mendel, and Henshi Gordetsky be married, married to a Zivug, a good, Mishor Shmatam, Bimhera, Bimhera, Bimhera. Also, the Kadosh Baruch Hu shall send refuah shelema to Eser Bat Vishna, Yishara Yosef Ben Zari, Rachel Bat Tziyona, Yair Ben Jacqueline, and Natalie Bat Sarai Menu. And also for an overall hatzachah of health, wealth, happiness, success, and all they do, spiritual success, financial success, for Stacey Esther Bat Priyam, Guy Ben Dina, uh, Michael Citron and family, uh, Abraham and Yosef Sakal, uh, Jonathan Moshe and Julie Yarimi, as well as Shalom and Eliyahu Bnei Esther. Now, now that we got that out of the way. Amen. 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 Thank you. Not a problem. All right, let's get started. Amen. So, so in the previous classes, we zoomed in on some of the social influencers uh, that were traveling with the Jewish people in the desert. We zoomed in on the Erev Rav, of how they were complaining about one thing or the other. One time it was about the traveling, the other time it was about the food, another time was they wanted meat, they wanted fish, all these different things. And we have established that their hidden agenda was get me out of here, I don't want the Torah, I don't want the mitzvot. I don't want the spiritual work. Give me the physical. I don't want the spiritual. <clears throat> then we later on, we saw the social influence of the Meraglim. You know, leaders that were chosen to go and tour the land, to come back with a good report, to back up the words of Hashem, to back up the words of Moshe. And we saw later on uh, the effect that they had on Am Yisrael when they came back with, uh, uh, with a negative report. And then we also zoomed in into political movements within Am Yisrael. We saw that there was also Meraglim, even though they were leaders and they were individuals that went to tour the land, but in reality also they had a hidden agenda because they had such, such, such high social ranking and, you were, uh, and they were very concerned about where they're going to fall into the ranking once they move into Eretz Yisrael. We saw that they tried to influence Am Yisrael not to go to Israel. They also, in, in, in hindsight, said, let's go back to Egypt. Still can't imagine I could even say something like that. There were additional political movements that we looked into. Korach Vadato, that we see Korach, a very high-ranking uh, Levite, 
and the, the cousin of Moshe Rabbeinu, he all holds the ark, richest man in the world, <coughs> has been able to achieve Ruach HaKodesh. And we see that he too was not happy with his situation and he went ahead on a whole propaganda of trying to uh, not only convince 250 people to go on a suicidal mission where they're going to end up dying, all of them were going to die. Only one will survive. They all accepted it. But he was also able to convince many people within Am Yisrael that he was right. And they backed him up. And they and their children and everything that belonged to him got swallowed in the ground. We were also able to highlight some either, uh, other uh, 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 s- uh, plots and subplots within these uh, few parashiot that begin with Baalotecha, Shlach Lecha, Chukat, Bala, Korach. You see that they were also able to find over there the hidden agendas and hidden alliances that we saw with Balak and Bilam. These were warring nations, nations that didn't like each other, yet they were able to find the truce, find the common ground in order to attack who? Am Yisrael, for all the reasons that they, they, for all the reasons that they had, which basically they saw the, the might of Hashem, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, was on the side of the Jews, that they were able to get rid of the two biggest gangsters alive at that time, the two giants of Og Menech HaBasham and Sichon Menech HaEmori, which happened to be brothers. Now that they don't have the protection of these giants and, and, and they were killed by the Jewish nation, so they said, what's the power of these Jews? Oh, it's their mouth. They got a, they got a leader that knows how to pray. So let's bring them somebody that knows how to curse. And they brought Bilam. So we saw that they, they tried to even have a spiritual warfare on Am Yisrael. And when you go a little bit more into the parashiot, we also saw uh, we saw examples of foiled plan sneak attacks that were unbeknownst to the Jewish people in the desert. In other words, here we have characters, we have names, we have stories, we have subplots, plots. But then we are also able to see that we know nothing about the enemy. We don't have, we don't know their face, we don't know their name. But they're still out there hiding like bandits behind the mountains. And they were ready to attack us. And Hashem crushed that mountain. And later on showed us the glory of all those body parts. Which are how he protected us. And that was there also. And overall we saw that his Jews were constantly de- dealing with internal conflicts. Inter- people that are internally in, 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 the, in the population. People that are in leadership. People that uh, claim one thing uh, and really mean another people that are uh, high-ranking, low-ranking, middle-ranking, people that are our enemies, that are, we know that they are our enemies, people that are not our enemies, people that are completely high, have a no face, anonymous. Yet we see that through it all, we were able to survive. And we saw the details of each story, and we were able to find identical tactics, identical agendas, identical motives in today's headlines. We were, we were able to tie it in one way or another, Tommy said. Again, I don't want to report, repeat all the last three lessons, but we saw everything that's in the headlines, which is the Black Lives Matter, the Antifa, New World Order, uh, you know, the, the dark state, or, you know, the, I'm sorry, the deep state, all these different things, all these different plot lines, everything that's going on. We were able, even able to see how people in Europe jumped in on what's happening in the United States, how we have some, polit- the, the, you know, some, uh, political movements that are for, or let's just say against the Jews, were able to jump in and get involved somehow. Everybody forming some sort of alliance, some sort of a, a camaraderie through these situations in order to benefit one another. And again, at the end of it, when the headlines are not so, you know, when we get past the breaking news part of it, that shock effect that we get when we first see that first video, that first headline. But we can take some time, a week, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, for things to unfold, things to, to, to reveal themselves. We see that some way, somehow, we were all able to see that there, somewhere along the line, it's connected to Ami said, it's connected to, to, to something against the Jews or something that has to do with the Jews or some organizations that are just against Ami said. As a matter of fact, I, mean, I just want to put it out there. I just want to put it out there. They just came out with the George Floyd autopsy report. I saw that. Oh, my God. Unbelievable. They said he didn't die from, from asphyxiation. Oh, my God. I mean, if you, if you could just read that, it's absolutely yeah. amazing. That's why I said they like to sensationalize 
uh, situations and headlines and videos and, and, and sell a story because there are stories that sell. But in reality, in reality, you have to, you have to uh, know that beneath everything that's being presented to us on the news as a truth, you have to question it simply because the Gemara and the Zohar told us we live in Alma de Shikra. We live in the world, Olam Shekir, the world filled with lies. There's no truth in this world except for the Torah. That's the only thing that's emit. <clears throat> Having said all that, I have a few questions. Let's start from the beginning. Why did the Erev Rav, the mixed multitude, which we know was a, a mix of a, you know, mixed multitude, meaning it, comp it was comp comprised with a few different types of nationalities, but the bulk of it were Amalekim, that were part of the mixed multitude that traveled with the Jewish people in the desert. Why did the Erev Rav succeed in convincing the Jewish people to side with them? Why were they convinced that going back to Egypt was better than being in the desert on the way to Israel, led by Moshe, protected by Kadosh Baruch Hu? How, how, could, that be, how could that be possible? I have another question. How did the 10 spies convince an entire nation that Israel is a bad place to inhabit? I mean, this is after Hashem has given it the, 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 the royal stamp of a king, Eretz Zavat Halav Udvash, the land of milk and honey. Not only that, Moshe Rabbeinu promised them that this is going to be, that this is going to be the land that, that was promised to their forefathers and they're going to inherit it. How is it possible that the 10 spies were able to convince the entire nation not to go to Eretz Yisrael. Imagine, against Moshe's words, against uh, Kadosh Baruch Hu's promise, God's promise, and of course, the history that's been traveling with them for years, for, for, for hundreds and hundreds of years, that one day the children of Abraham will inherit the land. Here it is. The time has come. Yet 10 people were able to convince an entire nation otherwise. Millions and millions and millions of people. The, 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 uh, the, 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 the punishment that they got was, or, or Moshe held accountable, 600,000 between the ages of 20 to 60. Another question. <clears throat> How is it possible that Korah was able to convince the most elite, the most religious, the most influential holy Jews, heads of tribes, and Shem, they knew the name of the, the, the Shem of from God. Another commentary says that they were world famous to second guess Moshe and Aaron. I mean, if anything, these guys should be on the same camp as Moshe and Aaron. How is it possible that Mukorah had the ability to convince that group? And not only that, it wasn't so simple just going against Moshe and Aharon. It came with huge consequences. It came with the consequences that should, should one of them succeed, that means that everybody else dies because the test was by the hands of the Ketorin. The Ketorin is done only by a person, one person that's chosen by God to offer it. Anybody that touches it dies. We see in the, in, the, in the hands of Nadav and Avihu. So they were able to not only endanger their own lives, but the lives of their family. Now, in every scenario, a certain amount of Jews were convinced and eventually died. Meaning, there was a group with the Miraglim, a group with the uh, with the Erev Rav, a group with Korah. A group, every time one of these scenarios came up, one of these machloket, one of these conflicts came up, a group of the Jews died. As a, as a matter of fact, you know, again, to re-emphasize, 
in, in, in the generation of the, I'm sorry, in the incident of the Meraglim, of the spies, the entire generation perished. Dora Midbar, anyone between the ages of 20 to 60, which is a total of 600,000 Jews, all died. Ironically, ironically, today is the day, today is the day that the Meraglim spoke to Shonara about Eretz Yisrael. And not only that, every single year during the time that they were in the desert, the entire 600,000 would uh, dig their own graves, lie in it, and go to sleep on Tisha B'Av. And the following day, they would wake up. Whoever woke up gets to go for another year. Whoever is dead is dead. They just cover him up. And it was roughly about 15,000 Jews every single Tisha B'Av that would perish. Why? Because they believed the Lashon Harav, the Miraglim. Now, let's take an even closer look. Just to, I mean, really to crystallize what's going on over here. The Erev Rav, our first, our first glimpse of who they are is Heta Egel. Remember? Today, tonight, that's what happened. Heta Egel. Heta Egel is the time that uh, on the 17th of Tammuz, Moshe Rabbeinu comes down with the tablets. He sees them with the golden calf. Uh, golden calf. He drops the tablets and he goes up again for 40 days, up until Rosh Chodesh Alul, and comes back again on Yud Betishrei, on Yom Kippur. So we see that our first interaction with this group of people is that they were bad for the Jewish people. The second glimpse that we get at this Erev Rav, we see that they were the Mitonenim. They were the ones that complained. They complained about the walk in the desert. They complained about the food. What was their fate? Esh b'kseh ha'machaneh. A fire consumed them at the edge of the, of the encampment. Now, that's when they were complaining about the, the walk. Later on, they complained about the what? About the food. Oh, let's go back to Egypt. The watermelons, the fish, the meat, this, that. What happened? They ended up dying in Kavot Tava. For this, I'd like to read the Pasuk. I don't think we read it during this lesson. It's in Perikud Aleph. Perikud Aleph. Pasuk Lamed Bet and Lamed Gimel. And it says over there. They, they were still uh, with, their, with the meat in between their teeth. And Hashem was very upset with that, with the nation, with the Am. Every time it says Am, you know that this is uh, the Erev Rav because they're the ones that sinned. It doesn't say B'nai Israel. Zap! Another, another plague. That, that place was called the Kivrota Tava, which is another way of saying that the, the, the grave site of the, uh, uh, of, the, of the people that desired, that lusted. Because that's where they buried all the ones that were cultivating a desire, which was at that time for the food. So, okay, so we see. We see that the Erev Rav is a bad bunch. You don't want to get, you know, three strikes already. So right here, I just want to stop and say, what happened to the millions of Jews that were there? What happened to the millions and millions of Jews that were in, uh, in, the, in the desert? The under 20, the over 60, and the ones that are in between. Every single person over the age of Bar Mitzvah, they're seeing all of this going on. Where are they? Why aren't they saying anything? Why doesn't anybody stop them? I mean, even after the Egel, right after the Golden Calf, the minute they start saying something, hey, hey, guys, guys, you already got us in trouble once. We're not interested in getting into it again. 
please, please, Erev Rav, on the outskirts. Do not, do not get involved. Every time you guys get involved, we get into a, we get into a, a plague. Why wasn't there a movement against the Erev Rav? When they were holding up signs for watermelons and for cucumbers and for onions and garlics, and when they were looking, when they were campaigning for fish and meat, why wasn't there an equal movement from the millions of Jews in Eretz Yisrael to say, "Go back to Egypt, leave us alone"? Torah, yes, Misaim, no. Where were all the Jews? Where was the resistance to Erev Rav? Furthermore, the of Rav, they sinned. They also caused others to sin. Moshe Rabbeinu tries to resolve the issue. He goes, he, 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 you know, right away, he goes into the Shammai. We know that the he, you know, he asks for forgiveness. Later on, he's able to pray against. He was to get the second luchot. Uh, Moshe Ben was doing his job as a leader. Forgive him, Hashem. Let's move forward. Let's put the past behind us. Let's, you know, let's let's concentrate on the future. The people they got killed by the Levim, by the way. It was the only group of people that gave him a resistance. So you have to understand. You got twelve tribes, millions of people. Who comes to the rescue? The rabbis, the Levim. And by the way, this action is what gave them the honor of serving Hashem in the Mishkan and Bet HaMikdash. If it wasn't for this action, the people that would be working in Bet HaMikdash right now would be the firstborns. The Bechorim are supposed to have that job, but we lost it. It was given away to the Levim because the Levim stood up for Hashem. Levim stood up for Kadosh Baruch Hu. Levim stood up for the honor of God and for the honor of the Torah. And that's how they got the honor to serve Bet HaMikdash and serve in the Mishkan. Where is Am Yisrael in all this? How come nobody from Am Yisrael picked up a dagger to kill the Erev Rav? How come nobody, nobody said anything in the time of Chet HaEgel? Let's put that on the shelf for a second. How about, let's talk about, and let's take a closer look at the episode of the Meraglim, of the spies. We know that all men between the age of 20 to 60 accepted Lashon Hara about Israel. Like we said, 600,000, their fate was to die every Tisha B'Av, roughly about 15,000. Except for Yoshua Binun and Kalev ben Yefune. They're the only ones to stand up for Israel. Again, just imagine it. Just imagine it. The entire nation, uh, by the suggestion of 10 spies, are right now all one hand, one hand, we don't want to go to Israel. We don't want to go to Israel. We don't want to go to the land that God promised us, except for who? Kalev ben Yefune, Yosha benu, I would say Moshe Rabenu, and I would go even as far as to say maybe, uh, you know, maybe a few more of the, the Levites over there because they're not mentioned over here. Wow. W what an image. I mean, talk about, talk about popular opinion. So right here, after 40 Years, I'm sorry, not about not, not 40 years. Where is, uh, and this is now after the 10 plagues, Yetziat Mitzrayim, the splitting of the sea, the Bizat Hayam, where they got filthy rich by the ocean and, and from the Egyptians. They beat Amalek a few days after that. All, all that Hashem has done for them throughout the time that they were in the desert, the, the Be'er, Miriam, the Ananeh HaKavod, the, the, the man from the heavens, and all the Matan Torah, the Mahmad Har Sinai, I mean, what did they see? Where is their trust in, or where is the, the nation's blind trust in Moshe and Akadosh Baruch Hu? What happened? 
Where is their blind trust in their leader and in their, in, in their God? We know that they earned it. Hashem earned their trust. Hashem, Moshe Rabbeinu earned their trust. How did they lose them here? Where is the Naseh and Mishma formula of the Jews of just a few days ago? Where is the majority of the nation's uh, faith, trust in what's going on in the desert? I mean, 10 people are able to convince a nation? Where is Ami Sa'ad's voice? Imagine having 10 people on the news that are able to convince millions of people in, 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 the, state, in the country of America. Is it possible? Put that on the shelf. Let's move on to Korach. We see that Korach also with Datan, Aviram, and 250 of Nesiyeh, Da, Kohei Moed, Anshe Shem, these big shots, these are the, the cream of the crop of the Jews in the desert. The elitist gang of uh, Dor Hamidbar, which is considered Dor Hadea, there was no smarter generation to ever live like that generation in the desert, all ganged up on Moshe and Aharon. I mean, so smart, so holy, yet going against Moshe Rabbeinu and Aharon HaKohen, going against the word of God, it makes no sense. But, also, but what doesn't make even more sense is where are the Jewish brothers and sisters in the desert? Where is Am Yisrael speaking up, stopping this madness? Hey, do not approach Moshe. Do not uh, approach Aaron Kohen. Aaron Kohen, Rodev Shalom, Rodev Shalom. He saved my marriage. He's putting peace in the camp. Everybody loves him. He's the most beloved person in the desert. How could you even say something about him? Moshe Rabbeinu, he's proved himself time and time and over again. Lay off of him. Korach, Datan, Aviram, 250 cohorts. I'm, I'm, we're doing a new, a new march. Moshe Aharon, Moshe Aharon. Where are they? Where are the rest of the millions of Jews that were in the desert while this was happening? Why isn't Amisai speaking up? Why aren't they stopping this madness? Millions of people, young and old, where are you? Where are you? And throughout all everything that we've just uh, uh, detailed, we see that everybody was just standing back and watching. Tragedies unfolding in front of their eyes over and over again. And all these scenarios, we saw all the negative influence of others on us. Oh, you know, look how Erev Rav affected us. Look how the Miragli affected us. Look how Korah affected us. Look how, uh, uh, you know, like how Bilam affected us. Look, and we're constantly pointing the finger at other people and how they're affecting us. Oh, look at the foreign ideology of Erev Rab. Oh, what about the power-hungry officials or, uh, or power-hungry uh, uh, community leaders like the Miraglim or like Korah? And we can always stand back and point a finger at someone else for what is happening to us. Could always blame somebody else for our troubles. But where were the majority of the Jewish nation for all these events? Where were they? Young and old, where was their voice? Where were they? The only way we could imagine it is they were just standing back, just watching, either going along with the movement silently, or just waiting to see how things pan out. Otherwise known as sheep. The sheepish mentality that groups of people sometimes get into. Let me just watch how things pan out. Well, you know what? I support what's going on with them. But from afar, without getting involved, silently, 
And you know, silence is admission. When you keep your mouth closed, it's like you're agreeing. And this entire time, while all these different movements, these agendas, these hidden agendas were traveling through the camp of Am Yisrael, the rest of Am Yisrael was going along with it. Either by not speaking up, or either by just sitting silently waiting for it to pan out. Chas v'shalom, am I speaking? Lashon hara about Am Yisrael. Never, not at all. I'm just trying to think how it could possibly be that way and how we could possibly tie it into our learning today. Because those were great people. Those were tzaddikim. We can't even judge them from the comfort of our own homes, what they were going through over there. We don't even understand those, those Jews. They were on the highest level. They saw God. I don't think what I'm saying means that we can even understand their, their, their vantage point. They probably have, you know, a hundred different other reasons to why things happened the way that they did. Half of the things that happened in the desert were for our sake, not for theirs. But just to understand that there was a small group of people that caused a lot of trouble, and there was a large amount of the population that did nothing. So this is not so different from today. Not so different. Let's try now to let's try now to match it up to what's going on in the news. We have a mixed multitude of people terrorizing the streets. We got uh, BLM, Antifa, or uh, run-of-the-mill thugs that are that are not connected to any organization. A mixed multitude of people that are right now amongst us, in the streets, living amongst us, terrorizing the world, terrorizing the United States. Why? Each one has a hidden agenda. One guy just wants to get a brand new pair of sneakers or a new Gucci belt. Another one is doing it for the justice of one thing or another. The other one's doing it for anarchy. Everybody's got a hidden message. But we're living with them, rioting, looting, destroying property, violence and murder is peaking right now in these lawless pockets in America. Peaking. Look what's happening in New York. I feel, I feel sad for that city. And are they being stopped? Are they being stopped? And I'm not talking about law enforcement. That's a whole other political story. Getting defunded, getting a, you know, people that are in office that are holding your hands back from protecting yourself, protecting citizens. Let's not talk about that. When I say, are they being stopped? I'm talking about are regular citizens stopping regular citizens? Are regular people stopping regular people from looting? Is there somebody that say, hey, don't break that window. Hey, don't rob that, that store. That's not right. You're not allowed to steal. Are there regular people stopping regular people from doing, the, from doing wrong? People would rather step back and film it. They want to get it on video. These iPhone warriors. The cop is killing a man on the floor. I'm not going to jump on the cop to stop him from murder. I'll take out my phone and I'll film it. Oh, you got this, this, this black guy coming and knocking out this white old lady. I'm not going to stop him. I'm going to film him. I got a white guy going to now, you know, hit another black guy or whatever's going on, all this racial tension that's going on over here. doesn't matter, black or white. You see both sides of the story on the news. Are you going to stop it? Are you going to stop? Hey, hey, leave that guy alone. You know, peace, don't fight. No, 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 no. Let me take out my phone and let me film it. They'd rather film the robbery. They'd rather uh, uh, film the kid, the, 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 the kid or the violence then stop it. They'd rather get it on video than stop the crime that's happening or the violation or the, or the violence that's happening. Why? Because they'd rather watch it and not get involved. Okay? They'd, most people would rather watch it happening a few feet away from them rather than get involved. 
And the reason for that is once again, the sheepish masses. You have to understand that there, in, in the world, there are leaders and there are followers. And it's very, very evident in this world that there are leaders and our followers. I'll try to crystallize this a little bit so we can understand. The way we dress, okay? Fashion. Why, do, why am I wearing this jacket? Why is my friend wearing that shirt? Why is that girl wearing that dress and the, or those shoes or that, or that pocketbook or that hairstyle? The reason why is because we have leaders, trendsetters in the fashion world that dictate which way fashion goes this year, last year, this decade, next decade. There are leaders and there are followers. In fashion, there are trendsetters. We also see a, a, an example of the sheepish masses in the way we speak. Pop culture. If you pay attention to pop culture, which is whether television, movies, or music, the words we use, the lingo we use, the way we say things, is just, I heard it on TV, I saw it in a movie, I heard it in a song. Why? Because there are leaders that are gonna give you that content, and as a, and as a follower, you're going to follow. Leaders and followers is also in the sheepish, sheepish masses, there's also a, a, a good prime example of how we think. For example, nowadays, the way we think is dictated by Hollywood. The way that, what the actors think, what people say on TV, what they say, or, or the, the programming. I mean, the way we think, maybe you don't think about it, but if you take the word television, what's television? Tell a vision. They want you to tell, they want to tell you their vision. Television is when they want to tell you their vision. And if you notice, you're not watching a show, you're watching a program. They're programming you. There's a, everything that you see, when you go to the movies, it's, some, it's amazing. You have uh, actors that have way more followers. You have actors and you have uh, 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 in, in music stars, uh, rock stars that have more followers than the president, that have more followers than anybody that's in, the, in politics. I mean, if, if one singer decides to make a political comment, she's got 30, 40, 50, 100 million that will see things her way because they idolize her, because they like her, because they like her music. She's influential. She's an influencer, a social influencer. So the way we think nowadays most of it is dictated by what the actors say, what television pushes on us, and the programming that they offer us. The way we think sometimes is dictated by the government, whether it's officials in power, whether it's lawmakers or law enforcement. I mean, they can tell you, that's the law, and you have to believe it, and you have to follow it. That's the way you think. And right now, we live in a time where a lot of things are starting to make a lot of things make sense because laws have to make sense. They have to be just. They have to be just. They have to be right. But what about this next generation that's coming up? They've lost the way. How about two generations from now? Three generations from now? Can we trust them to put things into law? We feel so unsafe with them at the moment. We have leaders that control the way we think. And then there's followers that are following their ways. Another prime example of that is religion. Religion controls the way we think. And this is where it becomes dangerous. Because if you look at the history of religion, if you look at the history of Christianity, they used the, uh, you know, the, the power of religion to control the masses, to control the people. And they were in, 
at that time, there wasn't, the, you know, law enforcement wasn't like it is today. It wasn't because of the city, the state, the president, the law, law of the land. They did everything in the name of God. And you know how many people died in the name of God? Hundreds of millions of people died in the name of JC. They will go from continent to continent to say, you don't believe in our way, you don't believe in Christianity, we're going to kill you in the name of JC because that's the way. Nowadays, we don't have that. They're a little bit more calm. They become a little more, you know, Western civilization is modern right now. They're understanding. They're careful. They're politically correct. But not a problem. The Muslims are right there to pick up their slack in Islam. If you're not a Muslim, you're an infidel. And you die if you don't believe in Muhammad the Prophet. And you could see that today. You could see that in the news. They're not hiding it. It's getting stronger and stronger. And they're playing the numbers game with the population everywhere they go. And they want Sharia law everywhere. Look up Sharia law. See if you can live a day in that life. And in America, it's already been planted. It's already been planted. It's already, there's already movements. There's already schools. There's a, a lot of that already here. And it's being tolerated and it's being allowed. So again, I'll ask you the question. Why do the massive amount of people are on the sidelines? Don't get involved with the few that are pushing new agendas or hidden agendas. Why are, why are the few rebel, that are rebelling against the innocent and justice? Why is it that a few people are able to go and push the world or push the country into a state of chaos, into a state of fear, yet the mass of the population the millions and millions and millions and millions of people that are right now sitting at home in fear, not standing up and changing it and saying, no, thank you. We're not interested. Take it over there. Why are we, why are we allowing this to happen? Why are we standing in the sidelines while this is happening? And the answer to that is the same answer that we gave to the Jews in the desert. Because the sheepish masses are trained, are programmed to follow, to obey, and to get daily doses of fear instilled so deep in their hearts until they freeze. Many, many people either freeze when they have a, a situation in front of them flight or fight or they just become comfortably numb just like we said when somebody sees something in front of them they have to decide do i want to survive or do i run away do i fight or do i uh, or, or do i hide but we saw what we've seen in 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 this uh, in this generation society we have another way of dealing with it where you just become comfortably numb we gave the example of how to cook a lobster in the previous class. How does a lobster kill itself? Well, you put a live lobster into a boiling pot of water, and it's got the technology within its body to actually bring up his body temperature to the, body, to the temperature of the water. So as the water becomes 110 degrees, his body becomes 110 degrees. As the water becomes 120 degrees, his, it, the, his body's temperature, he can bring it up to 120 so he can survive. And so on and so forth, so on and so forth, until he gets to 150, 160, and then he kills himself. That's how lobsters kill themselves. You become comfortably numb with your surroundings until it kills you. And we see today that people are so comfortably numb because as long as it's on TV, as long as it's on my iPhone screen, as long as it's just sadistic eye candy that I can look at it, knockouts, murders, killings, rioting, looting, as long as it's just on my TV and on my iPhone, I'm okay. I don't have to do anything. Unless it's at my doorstep, 
I'm not moving an inch from my couch. Now, that type of complacency is the best environment for anarchy and rogue movements. When you have people that are just sitting back and just watching the show and doing nothing about it, it allows for these, it's a, it's a good breeding ground for what's going on in society today. Because fear has always been the best weapon to control the masses. I saw this online the, the, the other day. It says fear stands for false evidence appearing real. When you have false evidence appearing real, that creates fear. And that is so true today. And throughout history, from the beginning of time, and Jews in the desert, to the unrest in the world today, people are scared. People are drowning in fear. And all they want to do is stay safe. All they want to do is stay safe while the sludge of society is on our TV screens and social media streams. Changing the morale and the, and, the, and the morality of the world. However, fear can have a different outcome. Fear can also stand for face everything and rise. You could either be taken over by fear or you can allow it to stand for face everything and rise as it's demonstrated in this week's parashat, parashat Pinchas. And all this was just an introduction to this part because this is the last parashat that we're going to uh, include in this pocket of uh, parashat that we've been learning from Baalotecha up until Pinchas because Pinchas gives us gives us the prime example the prime example of what's the solution to the time that we live in. Let me give you some details about the parasha. Once again, the Jewish people have a conflict in the desert. What's new, right? After Bil'am was unsuccessful at cursing them, he gave some good free advice says, Elohi, Elohehem sone zima. He said, look, we went to the mountaintop. We tried to bring sacrifices. I tried to curse. We tried this spiritual warfare. It did not work. But I know one thing. I know one thing that the Jewish God does not like. The Jewish God does not like zima. Zima is promiscuity, lewdness, lechery. So what did they do? The king of Midian sent out a plan. He sent out, he opened up a portable pop-up shopping mall in the middle of the desert. And as the Jews are crossing by this shopping mall, they have these old ladies coming out with trinkets at a really good price. And the Jews, you know, we love to shop. They come, oh, this is beautiful. What's the price? Oh, amazing. That's a great price. The time, yeah. If you like what you see here, I have a huge showcase in my tent with a lot more selection. And if you buy a few things, I'll give you a discount. So I'm saying, sounds good. I can get something for my daughter, something for my wife, something for my mother. They go into the tent. And now the 60-year-old that was... Uh, bring them, luring them in uh, to take a look at some trinkets at a good price, turns out to be an 18-year-old bombshell. One of the most beautiful girls of Midian were brought to be uh, in the tent to seduce the Jewish people. And they start to talk, and things get, you know, things carry on, and 
they convinced them to drink wine. The wine caused them to get drunk and hungry. They convinced them to eat now that they haven't eaten in so long anything except for the man. And then when they got to the point of the zima, the girl told them, I'll be with you, but first you have to worship my Avodah Zarah. First you have to go and defecate in front of Baal Peor, of this deity. And they did it. Once again, the Jews fall for a plot, for a ploy, with a hidden agenda of the trinkets later on, of Baal Peor. And part of this story is that the king of Midian sends his daughter, the princess of Midian, Kuzbi Batsur. He sends his own daughter to find Jewish royalty and to make them sin. She was in search of Moshe Rabbeinu. On the way to Moshe Rabbeinu, she bumps into Zimri ben Salu. He's the head of the tribe of, of Shevet Shimon. They say he was about 250 years old. He tells her, I'm older than Moshe. I'm just as important. Look at all the people behind me. These are all my people. I'm the leader. And as, they, as he convinces her to be with him, at the end of last week's parasha, you get part of the story. And in this week's parasha, you get another part of the story. I'll read just a short excerpt from last week's uh, end of the parasha so we can see what happened over there. It says, Vine. והנה איש מבני ישראל בא ויקב אל אחיו אל המדיינית לעיני משה ולעיני כל הדת בני ישראל. So, Zibri comes to Moshe Rabbeinu and says, I want to be with this woman. He says, you can't, she's not Jewish. He tells her, your wife is not Jewish. He says, uh, why is it okay for you and not okay for me? Not only that. He says that there's a halakha. There's a, there's a halakha that you can't be with, uh, with a Goya. When, and this halacha escaped Moshe Rabbeinu at that moment. And then we see, Vayar Pinchas ben Alazar ben Aaron HaKohen, Vayakom ito chayda v'kach romach be'ado. All of a sudden we see one person in all of Am Yisrael. While all this is happening, again, once again, another revolution against Moshe Rabbeinu. Another revolution against the Torah. Another thing, uh, uh, another uh, incident against uh, the, the Torah and Hakadosh Baruch Hu. Anybody standing up? No. Everybody just standing there, watching Zimri, except for one. Vayapinchas ben Anazar ben Aruna Kohen vayakom toch haida v'ikach romach beyado. We saw that they are conspiring right now. And he sees what's happening. The deeper story is that they were having relations in the middle of the crowd. As a matter of fact, Moshe Pichas, when he saw this, when he says, What's the Eda? Eda was a, a group of people. Pichas got up from the sheepish masses that everybody's following. And he says, and he went and he put a, a Roma, which is like a javelin, underneath his jacket, and he goes into the tent while everybody's standing on line. You know, this, there's a line over here. And he takes Zimri and Kuzbi, and he puts the javelin in between their private parts and takes them outside of the tent. Because Pinchas was saying, or showing in his actions, who's going against Moshe? Who's going against the Torah? Who's going against Hashem? Not only that, while his entire life is in danger. He was surrounded by 24,000 of Zimri ben Salu's cohorts. His life is on the line. He stepped up to that role. In Hebrew, we call that Mesirut Nefesh, self-sacrifice. Nobody does that to Hashem. Nobody does that to the Torah. Nobody does that to Moshe. Nobody is going to desecrate our beautiful Torah and everything that we stand for. Even if I have to go die for it, he says. 
Why? To bring the honor back to Moshe, to bring the honor back to the Torah, to bring the honor back to Kadosh Baruch Hu. And what was the what was the the end result of that? It says, Vayu metim ba, first, Vayu metim ba there was a magifa. As soon as this started to happen, once again, the wrath of God comes down and starts to hit the people with a plague. How many people died in this plague? 24,000. What stopped the plague? What stopped the plague? Pinchas. Pinchas. His self-sacrifice. He stood up for the Torah. He stood up for Hashem. He stood up for what's right. He didn't take a back seat to what's going on. He stood up and said, no, not on my watch. He got rid of the problem and he stopped the plague. Now, when I saw the words and it stopped the plague, I right away said to myself, I need that. We need that. The whole world needs to activate the stopping of the plague. How do we stop the plague? Well, here it is. We've been given the formula. It's right here in this week's parasha. It's spelled out for us. No gematriot, no, no, no numerical value, no hidden messages, no midrashim. How? The self-sacrifice the Mesirut Nefesh of Pinchas. So before we, before we crystallize this a little bit more, we see that for the past few weeks, we've extracted many lessons from Pashat HaShavua. We've, again, many examples of different enemies, internal, internal enemies living amongst us, or living amongst the population, enemies in leadership with misguided motives, and personal agendas. And we've even seen foreign nations plan to attack Am Yisrael, and each one had their own reasoning to justify their motives. Am Yisrael has always been a scapegoat. When things don't go right, blame the Jews. We've always been the default reasoning for the shortcomings or lack of success of other nations. It's always convenient to pick on the weak Jew. And any lack of personal success can be pointed out to, to the one who got there and blamed them for your troubles. How did he get there? How did he get that position? How did he get that money? Oh, he took it. It belongs to me. God forbid that they should think that he earned it and they put the time and effort into it. And he's invested in it and his family's invested and we're all invested in each other's success. But the person right next to you just wants it to be handed over to him. Like we said, and when the sheepish masses are okay with attacking the scapegoat, we see that it's always been the prop throughout the ages. It's been the Jews' problem throughout the ages. Like it says, like we say in the Haggadah, Every single generation, there's a group of people that get up and want to destroy us. We know how the story ends. God always saves us in the end. There's always going to be a villain. There's always going to be a movement. There's always going to be a dictator. There's always going to be a, a nut job that decided that the problem in the world is the Jew. And we go through anti-Semitism, and we go through, <clears throat> through riots, we go through looting, we go through threats, we go through all these different things that are going on in the world. And in the end, Hashem saves us from their hands. Pinchas comes and breaks the trend. Pichas comes, and he stands up for the emet. Vaykanel Hashem. Vaykanel Hashem, meaning he stood up for, for God, stood up for the truth, showing us that all the leaders that failed, all the leaders that failed you, all the leaders that, the, 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 the leaders of the failed movements, the Meraglim, the Nesi'im, the Korach, the Erevrav, all these people that came up in society and told you, follow us, we're the right way, and you followed and you died because of them, he's coming to show us they all failed. 
Why? Because you were sheep. You just followed somebody else. You followed the masses. You followed the, the you followed movements. You followed uh, you know the the, the latest trend in polit in politics in the desert or in life. Binchas comes and teaches us what? Be individuals. Be an individual. Be a Moshe. Be a Yoshua Binun. Be a Kalev Ben Yefune. Be an individual. When fear strikes, you have a choice. When there's pachad, when you don't know what to do, you could either go for this is false evidence appearing real, and I'm going to panic. And you know it is because the Gemara and the Zohar told us this is Alman de Shikra. This is false evidence appearing real. The fear is the tool of the Yetzirah. So it's either you go for that, you fall for that, or you face everything and rise. Or you take that fear and you face it on and you rise from it. Like Pinchas showed us. There's a famous song that says, Misha Ma'amin, Lo Mefached. Whoever believes has no fear. It's always, you know, we can always tie back every lesson to Emunah. The, the best life tool a Jew can have in his tool belt, in his life's tool belt, emunah, belief, trust in Hashem, through everything, highs, lows, good, bad, whatever, it's all good all the time. You just have to get to that mentality. Because Misha Ma'amin, lo mefached. The one who believes in Hashem has no fear. He doesn't take false evidence and, 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 and accepts it as real. There's a, there's a challenge, I'm going to rise above it. As an individual, I don't need to follow what everybody says I should think, say, or do. The Torah is a myth. Moshe is a myth. Hashem is a myth. That's my litmus. That's my guide. That's my, that's my roadmap in life. That's how I make my decisions. Not political movements or memes on, on, on social media. They tell us that the final geula will be like the first geula. So, let's take a look at it again. Mitzrayim. In Mitzrayim, what do we have over there? We had sarot, we had problems, we had the, the troubles over there. We had a hard king, Melech Kasheh. We had a, a lot of Tum'ah. Nine-tenths of the world Tum'ah was in Mitzrayim. So if that, that was the first Geula, the final Geula, we're also going to have problems. We're also going to have a, a, a very tough government to deal with or, or to put tough political movements. And there's also going to be tons of Tumai. Look around you. Look what, what society has become. It's become cheap on so many different levels. Let's look again at the first Geula, Yetziat Mitzrayim. Yetziat Mitzrayim, it's a process. To get out of Mitzrayim, it's not easy. Mitzrayim also is your personal Mitzrayim. Everybody has... Uh, uh, an Egypt that they have to go through. Everybody has a, their own personal Egypt, whether it's financial woes, health problems, marital issues, shambite issue, child raising issues, uh, uh, work issues, so many different things that people are dealing with. Addictions. Yetziat Mitzrayim is a process. But we saw that one of the first things that Kadosh Baruch Hu asked the Jewish people to do in Yitzhak Mitzrayim is slaughter the sheep. Take a sheep, time to your bedpost for three days, and then barbecue him for Korban Pesach. Couldn't have been any other animal. Could have been a cow. Could have been a chicken. Why a sheep? I mean, I love this chidush. I heard it from Rav Alon Anava one time, and, and it really uh, resonated with me. <clears throat> because Hashem wanted them to slaughter the sheep that's in them. To slaughter their sheepish mentality. You're not going to be slaves anymore. You're going to be individuals. You're going to be unique. You're going to be free. You're going to be Torah Jews. 
part of Yetziat Mitzrayim then and part of Yetziat Mitzrayim now is to slaughter the sheepish mentality. Kill the slave mentality, the sheepish attitude. Find your individuality. Find your uniqueness. Now, nobody's asking you to save the world. Nobody's asking you to save the world. All we're asking you is to be an individual like Pinchas. What did Pinchas do? He brought back the honor to Hashem. Bring back the honor to the Torah. Bring back the honor to Am Yisrael. How? Do your part. Do your part. Bring the honor back to Hashem in your home. Bring the honor back to the Torah in your house, with your wife, with your kids, with your family. Bring the kavod back to Kadosh Baruch Hu in your surroundings. Start there. That's done. You check that box. You brought the honor back to Hashem. Go into your community. Go to your community. See if you can have, have effect on the guy who's sitting next to you in Shul. Or the guy who just started coming to Shul. Or the guy that's been there for, for so many years, but he's still on the wrong path. Start bringing the honor back to Kadosh Baruch Hu in your community. And if you have the power of an influencer, and you can go even more, take it to the next level. Bring the, the, the honor back to Hashem, not just in your community, in your city, in your state, in your country, in the world. Each one according to his yecholet, to his uh, capabilities. Don't watch others trample on the religion, on its rabbis, and on the Jewish people. Channel Pinchas. Wake up from your stupor, this being comfortably numb in the United States of America. This Mesirut Nefesh has the power to stop the Magifa. The self sacrifice of standing up to what's right has the power to stop the plague. And that's what it is. Everybody's looking for answers. Everybody's looking for the vaccine. Everybody's looking for the quick fix. It is a quick fix. It's the original quick fix. Be a good Jew. Follow the Torah. Don't stray. The plagues go away. They don't even find you. The Mesirut Nefesh, the self-sacrifice of standing up for Hashem and the Torah and its leaders is the first step, is the first step to not being part of the sheepish masses. And it's the first step to not be, not fall into that scapegoat mentality. Oh, it's always like this. God will save us. Yes, He will. But we can't rely on miracles. You have to step up into that role of a light onto the nations. We don't start wars. We finish them. But at the same time, it's not the time to just cower down and let everybody do what they want to do, say what they want to say. It's time to develop our Jewish identity in our homes, with our children, with our family, with our communities. And stop being a carbon copy of the goy that's on your, on your cell phone. We study them all day long. All day long, we're looking at them. What are they doing? What are they wearing? What are they eating? What are they saying? What are they doing? Then we take off our the screen, and that's it. We're, pro, we're programmed. If we spend that same amount of time burying our head in the Torah, Torah learning, then you, you'll come out of Pinchas. You'll come out of Moshe. You are a product of your choices. I'd like to conclude with one final thought. With all we have going on as Jews, and we have a track record of superheroes, the way we defy extinction and endless enemies,
and how we've been able to be such a small, tiny country and so in a scattered group of people throughout the world, we're still here. We're still here, we're still alive. We're survivors. By discovered in this lesson, that the two weakest points of the Jewish people, our kryptonite, what makes us lose, are two things. Lack of unity, division makes us lose. And number two, zima, lewdness, improper relations, promiscuity. Those are two things that will be the end of us. When we're not united, when there's division in Jews in the diaspora or Jews and in Eretz Yisrael, that's strike one. And the other thing is, Elohim sone zima. God hates when the Jewish people are acting lewd, promiscuous. So we know that the Jews win when we have unity, when we have a hadut, when we have simcha, when we believe in the Torah, when we act, when we perform the Torah. It's, it's, it, we, that, that's what achdut, simcha, Torah. Those three things guaranteed, guaranteed we're winners. But we just discovered that when there's division, lack of unity, and zima, we lose. So let's zoom super wide angle. Let's take you know, let's take a wide angle uh, picture or a, a super wide angle view at the big picture. Right now, today, Yud Zayin Betamuz. Tashin Pei, 2020. We are divided both physically and spiritually. Physically, look around you. We're quarantined, social distancing. I mean, we're, we're practically begging to go outside so we can uh, go to a minyan or, or go to some sort of uh, spiritual event that can hold more than 10 people. We are physically divided. Not that some Jews are in America, some Jews are in Hong Kong, some Jews are in Tel Aviv. We're talking about where we live, we are divided. It's by design. It's not by chance. Spiritually, we're divided as well. There's religious sects, so many different sects of, uh, of Judaism. In reality, it should be different traditions. You're Ashkenazic, I'm Moroccan, you're Breslev, you're Chabad. We have different uh, uh, traditions or minhagim, but we are united. We are all as one. Well, it seems like more and more everybody's like, well, I'll wait till you see it my way, and then you'll be part of my group. I'll wait till you see Chabad's way, Breslev way, uh, you know, the, the, the Sephardic way, the Ashkenazic way. This is, what, where is the rabbi that's uniting us? Where is our Moshe Rabbeinu? Where is the movement to unite? Where is the movement for Achdut? Everybody is unified within their sect of religion, their neighborhood, their, uh, their, their traditions, Where's the unity? I accept you, you accept me, we're all Jews. There's spiritual division. I mean, I, I have to throw this in there also, even though it's not spiritual, but it's causing our Neshama to be uh, divided, is the political aspect to it. There's Jews in America, Democrats and Republicans, Jews that outright see that, certain, that, that the Republicans and Trump are for Israel. The Democrats are becoming more anti-Semitic and, and, and are supporting all the movements that are against Israel. And yet what? They're getting votes, millions of votes. Politically, we're getting divided. How are we gonna how, how are we gonna win? Where's our Ahdut? In Israel, they haven't been able to form a government. They haven't been able to, 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 to come to terms with how to lead the country. 
there is so much division within Israel because of politics, not even to talk about religion. The Yetzirah is using every ploy to divide us, to divide us. Because lack of unity is how we lose. It's our weak point. The war today. So, point number one, division, both physical and spiritual, for sure. For sure. Point number two, about Zima. You have to understand that the war today is not the war of yesteryears. The war today is not with tanks, planes, cannons. Eh, you know, that's, that's like for the movies. That's like how we used to fight wars. Today, the war is different. Today, the Yetzirah has found a better way, a cleaner way, a more effective way to kill people. The Yetzirah is a modern evil inclination. It's not that evil inclination of our grandparents. He's modernized. He's different. He's, he's using a different warfare. He's using mental warfare, spiritual warfare. It's a different type of war that he's fighting. And the war is personal and it's real. He fights you one-on-one. -on -one. The Yetzirah has taken upon himself to fight each person one-on-one. -on -one. He doesn't need to fight continents, countries, regions. He's taking it to you. You wake up in the morning, he's right there for you. And he's there all day long till you close your eyes. And, and when, you're, when you're sleeping, he's doing his mental push-ups to come even stronger tomorrow. Because he's fighting you one-on-one. -on -one. And where? On the screens, on the phones, on the movies, TV, music, social media. What's your pleasure? What's your vice at the touch of your fingertips? At the touch of your fingertips. The war is in your hand. The Yetzirah has given you an outlet. Where do you want to go in the world? What do you want to see? What do you want to try? Everything is at your fingertip. And he's got your mind. And he's got your mental space. And he's got your neshama busy doing nothing. Turning your mind into mush while you scroll up on social media. While you watch another movie from Hollywood. While you watch another TV show. Seeing how another Goyish family lives their life. How does that connect to your neshama, to your Judaism, to Ahdud, to the essence, to your ultimate tikkun of what we're here for? It doesn't. You're just boxing with the Yetzirah all day long, but it's pleasurable. You're comfortably numb. Beautiful colors, beautiful sounds, beautiful imagery, beautiful eye candy. It's not a tough war. He's very, very slick. He's very, very slick. nowadays again we said that when we are divided and when we have zima so he says no problem we have social distancing there's the division social media there you go that's there's your zima social media as soon as you go on there everything is there you want zima <laughs> sure here's the menu you want to see lashon hara not a problem. How many people talk about how many other people? They just post. Millions of people see. Thousands of people see. The Lashon Hara that's out there rampant in social media, it's incredible. The Sina, the hatred, the language. God forbid you should see something in a different way other than the other person on the other side. Boy, do they let you hear it. Why? Because everybody's an iPhone warrior. Behind that screen, behind that phone, they're, they're big shots. They're not scared to say anything. Because as long as it's not in my front door, as long as it's not, it's just on my TV screen, I'm comfortable on the couch, I'm going to be part of the sheepish masses. The social media helps you 
not protect your eyes. Helps you not learn Torah. The Yetzirah knows what it's like to pick up the phone and get sucked into it for a half hour at a time, 20 minutes at a time. Go look at your screen time at the end of the day. That report is scary. Six hours on your screen, eight hours on your screen. It's scary. How much of it was Torah? How much of it was Torah? Be real with yourself when you answer that. Now, this portal for foreign ideology, as we sit there and we study the Gentile world for entertainment, strictly for entertainment, we're so curious about their sports, about their shows, about their fashions, about their politics. As our standards get lower and lower day by day, especially now, especially now since the country took a turn for the worse, we're, we're able to see violence like nothing. We can see people get knocked out like it's nothing. Back in the days, if you saw a fight on the street, you would freeze, you would talk about it for months. Nowadays, there's at least 10, 20, 30, 40 videos of fresh knockouts, whether it's a, a young people, whether it's a, a racial thing, whether it's just, you know, just random acts of violence. Our eyes today see things that a hundred generations combined will never see. A hundred generations combined will never see what we see in a day on social media. We became a generation of iPhone addicts and iPhone warriors. And that doesn't say much. And all this is in the comfort of our own homes. Whether you like it or not, you're a sheep. I'm a sheep. We're all a sheep. One way or another. If it's the way we dress, the way we think, the way we act, the way we talk, the way we behave. This whole lesson has come to an end with one prime example of what's the call to action. What's the walk away from this four part series? The walk away? Be Pinchas. Have Mesirut Nefesh. Have self sacrifice. For no one else, but for yourself. Nobody's asking you to jump in front of 24,000 people. And, and, and put a javelin inside the sinner's belly. We're not asking you for that. Be a pinchas in your life for yourself. For yourself, you need it. You need to be an individual. You need to, have, to bring the honor back to Hashem in your life. You need to bring the Torah back, the, the honor back to Torah in your life. You need to bring the honor back to the rabbis in your life. You need to inject the mentality of Pinchas into your life. And if you're lucky, your wife and your kids will follow. And if you're lucky and Hashem gives you the zikhut, you can take it on to your friends so they can do that to their, in their homes. And if you go even further, if Hashem gives you the chayr, the kohot the, 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 to do it, do that in your community. Don't save the world. Start with yourself. Don't wait for your neighbors and don't wait for your leaders to take you there. The neighbors are the Erev Rav. The leaders, all of them are borderline questionable. You have to take your life into your own hands and do what's right according to the one thing that's emit in this world, the Torah. And all this alone time, all this alone time that Hashem has given us, without work, without, with the social distancing, with the quarantine, is just so you can discover yourself again. Just so you can have time to discover yourself again and become an individual. Not to be around the masses. Not to be around your community. Not to be around your, your, your friends. Be by yourself a little bit. Think about yourself a little bit. Think about the Torah a little bit. 
In Hebrew, quarantine is called bidud. If you take the numerical value of the word bidud, you take the bet yud, that's 12, dalet vav dalet is another 14, altogether is 26. Quarantine, bidud, is a gematria 26. Why do you have to go be quarantined on your own? In order to get to know 26, yud ke vav ke. In order for you to start to forming a relationship with Kadosh Baruch Hu. Today's hidden agenda of the, the hidden agenda of the enemy is being broadcasted on the screens. The hidden agenda is on your phone. The hidden agenda of leaders, political leaders, social leaders, social influencers, anyone that you want, even friends, countries, religion, rabbis, this. Anything that you want, everybody is on, every everybody's got their hidden agenda, and it's on your screen. And we are becoming zombies, tapping into their truths, not our truth, their truths. Our truth is one truth: is the emet, it's the Torah. Use it as a GPS. Wake up in the morning. Where am I going? Where am I, what am I going to do? Not a problem. Hold the book. Open up the pages. Whatever the pages tell you to go and do, that's what you do. Not your cell phone, not your GPS, not your friends, not your leaders, not your community leaders, not your, uh, not your uh, uh, country leaders. We don't know anymore whose side, who's on, who's on what side. We learned that from Korach. We learned that from the Ba'erev Rav. We learned that from the Meragli. We learned that from all these. We don't know who the enemy is anymore. What's real, what's not real. True, what's not true. The only guide, the only GPS, the only beacon is the Torah. We've proven so many hidden agendas on this series from so many different channels to bring us to one conclusion. There is only one truth in the world with no hidden agenda, the truth of the Torah and Hashem. The more you align yourself and the more you align your days and time with it, with the only truth in this world, the more you will live a real life and a fulfilled life. Even in the midst of all this evil and lies and craziness that's going on, you can still have a meaningful and, 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 and a, um, a real experience and a fulfilled life even during these hard times. Sometimes we have to step back. Sometimes you have to step back and just understand that the Jewish journey is a special one. We don't have the same journey as everybody else. We're a tiny fraction of the world's population, less than 1%. We're a special operations team sent from HaKadosh Baruch Hu into this world to make a tikkun olam. Nobody in this world has that duty. Nobody's waking up in the morning with the responsibility of fixing the world. We are, but many of us as Jews have abandoned the mission and are now just watching how the other world lives and completely confused. I'm Jewish, but I act like a goy, think like a goy, behave like a goy. Am I a goy? Am I not a goy? If it wasn't for Shabbat, if it wasn't for my Brit Milah, I don't know. I don't know where I would be and what it would be. I don't know. We have to come back to the original formula. We're very, very, very far away from that Jew in the desert. Whatever the Torah says, we will do. Give me the reasoning later. How far are you from that? That's what your starting point is to getting back to it. That's the work. That I should give you all this bidu time to bring you back to that point because that's what's going to merit you the geulah. That's what's going to merit you the simcha. That's what's going to merit you everything that you're looking for in your life. Otherwise, you're going to be lost. Your mind is going to be preoccupied with all the craziness in the world. It's not going to give you a chance to think about spirituality, to, speak, to think about God, to think about the Torah, which is the, the, the essence of what a Jew is in this world for. The Yetzirah is making a very, very big push to take every single minute of your day and every single uh, millimeter of space in your brain in order to preoccupy you to not 
be spiritual, to not get connected, to not to bring it back to where it's supposed to be. A beacon, a light onto the nations. He's making a big push. How do you know where you stand? Be real with yourself and say, how addicted am I to my phone? Because how much Torah is coming out of that phone? Now, the Jewish journey is a special one. And we are reaching very, very challenging stages in this journey. And we're reaching some very challenging times everywhere in the world. In order to withstand, in order to overcome, in order to succeed and make it to the other side of this dark story, because it's going to end. It's going to end. We're going through a bad patch in the world. Eventually, it's going to be Mashiach time, and we're going to have a thousand years of peace of just learning Torah, and God is the ruler of the world. But until then, you have to survive. You have to make it. In the, in the middle of all this darkness, you need to hold on to the light. And that's why the Torah is called in, in, in the Zohar, Oraita. Oraita coming from the word Or, light. In the darkness, you hold on to the light. The beauty about the Torah is that it has no hidden agenda. It's a book. It's a manual that gives you the keys to being successful in life. And nobody, nobody is asking you for money. Nobody's asking you for anything. God is just telling you, you are Beni Bechori. You are my firstborn. You are my son. Here are 613 ways to connect with me. 613 ways to get it right so you can merit Chaim Nitzchim, eternal life. Go. We have the choice. Go left, go right. Be good, go bad. Do good, do bad. It's your choice. I'm here to tell you that the, the hardships that we go through is the, is the choices that we've made. We've brought all these stories upon ourselves. If we want out, there's a way out. There's a way out. It's Teshuvah, Simcha, Torah, Ahdut. It's all in our book. Bezat Hashem, that we merit to live in a life with no hidden agendas. Live in a life of truth, of emet. That soon this bottom level of tum'ah disappears. And just that we see so much tum'ah in the world is because on the exact same token, there's that much kedusha in the world. And because there's so much kedusha in the world, then there's a light at the end of the tunnel. And we just want to have as many Jews be on the other side of it so we can dance in a circle in Yerushalayim with Mashiach in the middle. שהשם ברך אתכם, שמח אתכם, שיתו לדרכם לחילה, ולמדה למדת זו כדור אחרון. If you guys have any questions on Zoom, I'll stand for a few more minutes. If not, we'll just end it. חזק ברור, שון. Could you go over your acronym for FEAR again, if you don't mind? Sure. So FEAR has two different meanings. It could be false evidence appearing real. Or it could be facing, where did I write it? Face everything and rise, either or. Thank you. You said some very nice things tonight. I appreciate it. Oh, thank you for tuning in. I really appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, guys, if there's no more questions, if there is any questions. It's, it's so, I, I mean, it's, it's earth shaking. It's, I, I can't even explain this to you. It's how I feel after this. It's, my whole gut is like turning. <laughs> And I, think, I can always you know, count on you to make me feel good. No, it's no. I, I'm I'm serious. Every time I think you can't get any like more, uh, you know, because you have so much feeling, and I feel it, and I just it's like I'm picking up on it. And I say this kovav is a parsha uh, is a tehillim for Pinchas. I say for the last few months I'm in a lot of tehillim groups. 
So that particular, I always get 106 and 107, you know, for the different days. I always get yes. that one. And I was just sitting with my daughter-in-law and I was, you know, we were saying to Hillam and I said, I always get the one with that Pinchas stop the Magefa. <laughs> I said, where's, I keep saying, where's Pinchas? Where, who's Pinchas? Where do we have Pinchas? I don't know. Like you said, our leaders, we don't have leaders. We don't have anybody to kind of lead us. It's so difficult because we don't have that. You know, that's why you have to do it for yourself. That's yeah. why you have to be a pin that, that's the right, that's, that's what saying. that's what jumped out at me when I was seeing all these things going on and then later on, I mean really, I didn't know how the series was going to end. But when I when I zoomed into the whole like pin story, I was like, there's the answer. Everybody's thinking about the same thing. Stop the magifa, stop the magifa, and it's so real the message that's over there. That's why it's so beautiful. The Torah is timeless. And it's completely irrelevant to what's going on today, today. And I think also, we just, there's, there's a lot of, you know, I listen to a lot of rabbis because I enjoy listening to Torah. And lately, I've heard so many rabbis going against so many other rabbis, I just don't know what to do anymore. They're, they're people coming out with lists of uh, non-kosher rabbis. I'm like, I look at these, I'm like, what do you mean? I listen to three of these guys. You go to this other guy, you listen to him on, you know, you go listen to some rabbis in Israel, they're giving a beautiful lecture, love the Torah. Ah, I'm starting to fly. Here we go. And all of a sudden, you know, starting to call each other's names, call each other names, and then starting to insult one another. I'm like, what's going on? The rabbi world is starting to fall apart too. What's this Lashon Haran one another? What, what am I supposed to do? I love his Torah. It's good Torah. But now he's not acting uh, correctly. What do I do? And when I ask rabbis, you know, I tell them, okay, what do I do? There's all these rabbis that are good rabbis, holy rabbis, you know, they, but I see them talking to Shona Rabbi one another. Everybody's telling me the same exact thing. Don't get involved. It's not your beef. It's not your problem. What you want to do is you want to take the Torah and all the psalet, leave it behind. Everything that is not connected to the Torah, disregard it. Or if not, go and try to find how do we How do we unite, Sharon? How do we unite? Nobody's united. Now, how, you know, starts, we're falling, starts, we're not united, you know? That's, that's the whole thing. It's not for you to do the entire job. All you have to do is do you and your family and all the people that you have to reach over, and that's it. Eventually, all these pockets of united Jews will unite, but it has to start at home. Eventually, Sean, yeah, we'll, we'll piece the puzzle together. Sean, I have... I, I just want to bring up something. I mean, if, if, you, if you listen to what's been going on this entire time in the desert, where they witness God in, in a form that we will never, until Mashiach comes, have these miracles seen and have Hashem with us in 40 years, providing us with man and water in the most impossible conditions. Yet, one of the things that we keep seeing in the last parashot in the entire time that they're in the deserts, which are highlighted, is the sins that they're doing. Right, and they're sinning, and and we question ourselves here in 2020, saying, if we were there, we would never do that because we see Hashem and we and everything He does, and He's right there. But I think that one of the things that we can pull from this is that no matter how much the presence of Hashem is, and no matter how much Hashem shows the world that He's the Creator and He's in charge of everything, I guess going back to what you said yesterday that you have that freedom of choice or speech or whatever. You always see that no matter how good it can be with Hashem in our life, you still have resistance. You still have people that don't believe and you still have people that create these scenarios. So it comes back to our days today when we don't have any of these things to see or to live by or, or man or Shekhinah or Bet HaMikdash or anything else. Even harder for us. Even harder for us. So, yes, because we, we feel that, again, from the comfort of our home, sitting on the couch, uh, on Zoom, we could say that the, how could the generation of the desert do such a thing? Meanwhile, they were one of the holiest generations ever. Dor Hadea, the smartest one. They saw God. They saw the real miracles. They saw everything. They lived out the story that we learn every single day of our life. They lived it. So you mean to tell me those guys are so disconnected from the truth that, that me, a simpleton like me, 3,000, 2,000, 3,000 years later, know better than them? The answer is absolutely not. Right. We only know a fraction of the story. We only know, me, not a fraction of the story, like something is hidden from us. We don't understand fully that the type of story that we understand is on a very minute level. 
You know, they say when Mashiach comes, the Torah that we learn today is going to be like child's play because it's going to get opened up for us and we're really going to see what's hidden behind the hidden, the truth behind the truth, you know, like things that are going to be revealed to us. But I heard one explanation, one chidush, that really uh, uh, crystallized it for me to understand it better. A lot of the things that are happening over there, it's not for them. It's not for them. Meaning, they knew better. They knew not to do those things. But the reason why they did it, especially that generation, is because it needed to be an example for the generations to come. I'll give you two examples. One, a long example, and then a short one. One is going to be about Daegel, one is going to be about Shabbat. So you mean to tell me that the generation that saw the 10 plagues, splitting of the sea, that had all the money in the world, that I was healthy, that saw uh, uh, Hashem in the Shaman, they pointed out to the Merkava that they heard the voice of God on Har Sinai, that had Moshe Rabbeinu as a leader, that generation created a golden calf, a, a, a statue made out of gold, and says, you're my God? They know that that golden calf is not, not a God. They know. They know. They know it doesn't move, doesn't talk, has zero powers. And even if it has any powers, it's just powers from Kishu. And not only that, which basically means that it's black magic. And black magic is just the power of Tum'ah. And all the powers in all the world all come from Hashem and Od Milvado. The good powers and the negative powers, it's all God. You're worshipping the sun. You're worshipping God. God created the sun. You're worshipping a, a, a Getchka. Hey, where does it get its black power uh, from? It gets it from uh, from Akadosh Baruch Hu, from the other side, from the Tumad that's available. And Od Mirvado, it's all from God. So how could you possibly say, worship a golden calf? So the beautiful lesson over there is this. If the generation of Dor Hadea, the generation of the uh, of the desert that saw the Esra Makod, that saw Yetziat Mitzar, that saw the splitting of the sea, that saw all the uh, Matan Torah, that saw all these things, and they worshipped the Egel, and Hashem forgave them, that means, what could you possibly do that Hashem doesn't forgive you? Could you possibly be worse than that? Nobody can be worse than that. Nobody can be a Jew that saw all of that and worshipped the, the, the golden calf and still get forgiven. Why did they do that? To show us that you can be with tattoos, that you can eat pork, that you can do all the things that you did. But if you do Teshuvah, Hashem will forgive you. Because you'll never be worse than the Jew in the desert that did all that to worship the golden calf. That's the worst that it could be. But what is it to show us? To show us the power of Teshuvah. That a person can come back no matter what. Because the Yetzirah always likes to talk a person out and say, you... 50 years you didn't put on tefillin. You, you haven't had a kosher meal since your bar mitzvah. You, look at you, you're covered in tattoos. You, you want to become Jewish? You want to become religious? And, then, and the person's going to say, yeah, because I'm not as bad as the Jews in the desert that saw all that and worshipped the golden calf and Hashem forgave them. Hashem will forgive me as well. That's I, a longer story. Yes, go ahead. Can I ask you, there are so many different levels of Teshuvah. How do you know which level you've reached that is good enough? I mean, there's Teshuvah, there's Teshuvah on the Teshuvah, there's Teshuvah for doing it wrong last year, and now you're doing it better this year, and so on and so forth. It's a lifetime of Teshuvah. So where's the level when you're forgiven? How do you know? I when understand, you, sorry, I understand that when the problem comes to you again, and you ignore it and do right, then it's forgiven. But I really don't know. But since you brought it up, I'm sort of asking you. So Teshuvah, Teshuvah is, is, first of all, if you're already a person that's doing Teshuvah, that means you're connected or beginning to get connected or want to be connected. Now, it's just like a, the radio, you know? Let's say the station is 100.3. 100.1, 100.5. You got to get close to 100.3, right? You're right there. In other words, the teshuvah process, it's how good is your connection with God? You know when you're connected, you know when you're not. 
When you're connected to God, you feel it, you sense it, you live it. If you're not, you're still questioning. Did I still have to do Teshuvah? Did Hashem forgive me? Did He not forgive me? Did, the rabbis tell us, if you go into Yom Kippur and you don't come out of Yom Kippur knowing that Hashem forgave you for those sins, then what was the sense of, of, of Yom Kippur? You don't believe in that day that. You don't believe in the power of Yom Kippur. Hashem, you need to walk out of this saying, Hashem forgave me, I'm on a brand new baby. I got at least for one more year. If you're carrying things with you from the past and you still, you're still not, have, not forgiven, or it's still coming up to you, or you have these recycled events, all that means is that you need more teshuva. You didn't do it properly. A little bit more, a little bit more effort, a little bit more thought, a little bit more uh, repentance, a little bit more uh, you know, soul searching in order to really, really you know, take it off your soul, take it off your neshama. And if you see that your teshuva is not enough, you have to do acts of kindness towards it. So like that, it clears up your spiritual debt in the shaman. Let's just say you stole. Chazve Shalom. A person stole, right? Then you did Teshua. Hashem, sorry that I stole. Okay, but you still feel like, I still think about it. I still feel like I need to do Teshua on it. Okay, if a person stole $5, give back 50 if you if you did if you uh, you gave back you're still not doing it do acts of kindness start to do things for free without charging do something as Hashem I want to clear up my spiritual debt and and, and and you know Hashem in the nighttime I just read this recently on the Shvirat Pinchas lesson in the nighttime if you study in the nighttime what Hashem does is he gives you uh, he gives you uh, through your learning messages through your learning. You get messages. You'll read something that will spark something in your mind and in your heart, and you'll understand that it's connected to your teshuva. You, it, 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 something will come up, a subject matter, or this, and you'll see that Hashem is talking to you. Not like He spoke to you, like to Moshe Rabbeinu, face to face, with, you know, uh, with words, but you'll get messages. You just have to pick up your spiritual antenna and be able to pick up these signals that Hashem is giving to you, and little by little get cleared up. I'll give you one example from my teshuva process. I had many, many things that I needed to make Teshuvah for. And I also didn't know, when do I stop? When have I made enough Teshuvah about this one thing? And I found out that when I did a proper Teshuvah, my mind would not even think about it again. But when I didn't do a proper Teshuvah, it would always like surface to the top. It was always like every week, two weeks, a month, two months, it would still surface the imagery, the scenario, the person. So what I did is I was uh, made myself sensitive to that. So like that, when that thing comes up again for the third or fourth time, I caught it. Like I grab it in a net and I say, okay, wait, wait, I'm recognizing it. It's the fourth time you're on my mind. I did Teshuvah. Let me slice it, dice it. Let me flip it. Let me see what's going on over here and see what was that. And you think, start to think about it and you start to go more de deeply into it because your Teshuvah from last year, like you said, is not the Teshuvah of right now. And, whether you, if, and then you see that whatever additional teshuva process you added to it, cleared it up and it doesn't come back anymore. It doesn't come back anymore. So you can get signals. If it comes back up, catch it, deal with it yourself. Or in your nighttime, in your Torah learning, it'll come up with little messages. And just always be sensitive to think that you're connected and Hashem is speaking to you. How? Through your learning. What, what about non-Torah Torah learning, like Tikkun Aklali, Tikkun Chatzot? Does it have to always be Torah or not necessarily? That or is Torah. Be... That is Torah. Tikkun oh, Aklali okay. is, is Torah. Right? It's, those, are, those are 10 chapters of Tehillim. And, and not only that, we were given by a, a, a Torah giant, Rabbi Nachman Mibreslev, who revealed to us the secret of saying those 10 chapters in a row. Tikkun Chatzot is brought in uh, is brought down in Masechet Brachot that that's the time where Hashem is up and He's willing, that that's the most auspicious time to talk to God. Imagine setting up the alarm clock at 3 a.m. because you have a date with God and you're waking up and you sit on a chair and you're all groggy and your eyes are still tired and you take about 5 or 10 minutes just to get up and you're like, Hashem I woke up for you I understand that this is the best time to speak with you. And I just want to say thank you for ABC, one, two, three, you know, you know, go down the list. And then also, and I'm sorry for ABC, one, two, three, go down the list. And I want ABC, one, two, three, down the list. And I'm going back to sleep.
Boom. David Amelech used to do it day and nightly. <laughs> he, nightly. He would wait for that moment just to be able to praise God. And there's no more auspicious time to do that. And at the same time, a lot of people that are up at that hour like to cry for Jerusalem. Like to cry for the Jerusalem that's not built. And anybody who cries for Jerusalem or prays for Jerusalem at that particular time of the night merits to see Jerusalem when it's built. It's all Torah. You gotta yeah, find I, I understand that you have to, in every prayer, somehow fit in the prayers toward the benefit of Israel. And then the prayer is heard more rapidly, more easily. Right. So you, you just found a hack to pray. Uh, you know, the way that we pray, we pray in plural. Uh, everything is in plural because you are one of 14 million. You are not one of one. We are one big body and you are a tiny speck of it, just like I am. Together, put all together, put all the 14 million little souls together, we make up one Am Israel. So when you are praying, you are praying for yourself, but you are actually one of 14 million other Jews. So when you are praying, the rabbis tell us, don't pray only for yourself, because that's selfish. And if you don't get and if you don't get answered, then who knows if you're going to start going to pray only because you need something. But and if you don't get it, you might say, I'm starving. You know, prayer doesn't work. I ask for all these things and they don't come. The way that it works is you pray for Ami said. Why? First of all, you're one of them. Secondly, maybe, not maybe, but the way that it works is the prayer that you pray for Refua. Let's say somebody needs Parnasa. I'll walk you through a prayer. Hashem, I pray that every single person in the world, every single Jew that needs Parnasa, Refua, anyone who needs uh, 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 no, uh, uh, that needs health, that needs wealth, that needs Yeshuot, Briud, Seata Deshmaya, and all the things that in the world, every Jew, a boy, every man or woman that needs anything in this world, I am depositing my tefillah to you, Hashem Lashamay, for anyone who needs it right now. Because sometimes Hashem takes your tefillah and he answered, and your tefillah answers somebody else's need in, in China. In, in uh, Australia, in uh, England, in uh, Brooklyn. He takes your tefillah, and your tefillah is what answers another Jew. And on the flip side of it, there's another Jew that is praying for you, that you should have parnasah, that you should have refuah, that you should have everything that you need. We pray for each other, because what Hashem does is he collects all the prayers in the Shemaim into like a prayer bank, and he takes each tefillah and he says, this tefillah answers yours. And this tefillah answers his. And, and you know, and we see a sign to that in, uh, um, in Moshe Rabbeinu, in Parashat Ve'et Hanan. Soon he's going to pray 515 prayers. So the rabbis tell us, couldn't he just pray once? Why only, why 515? Why didn't he pray? Why did he pray uh, just once or twice or 50 times? or a hundred times, or two hundred times. Why did Hashem uh, allow him to pray 515? Well, first of all, because at 516, he would have been answered. So Hashem stopped him at 515. But the reason why he took him all the way to the mountaintop, all the way to 515, is because he said, I'm going to need Moshe Rabbeinu's prayers in future generations. So I better stock up as many as I need. He took up 515 of Moshe's prayers because one of them are going to be needed for this generation. And another prayer is going to be needed for a different generation, for a different situation, for a different scenario. Hashem took 515 of Moshe's uh, prayers and he deposited them into the prayer bank to be used at a later date because our tefillot are for each other. That's why we pray plural. And that's why they say also, anyone who prays for his friend gets answered first. So isn't it great? You can just pray for everyone else to be healthy, to be rich, to be, uh, to be happy, to, be, uh, you know, to have success in marriage and child raising. And you know who gets the re reward for that? Yours. Well, I suppose it depends on your intention too. If you pray for others because you want the benefit, it's not the same thing. 
So on that, note, on, that, on that note, there's also another concept in Judaism that's called Lishma Lo Lishma Achiagia Lishma. You are allowed to do things not for the right reasons. Eventually you'll get to the right reasons. You can you can pray for your friend to 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 be healthy so you can get healthy. It's okay. Even though that you have an ulterior motive. Because the rabbis tell us because you're not there yet to do it properly, it's almost a good practice, like a good uh, uh, workout. It brings you to the right place. It brings you to the right place. So they allow you to do it with the wrong intention because eventually you'll get to the right intention. You develop the right way. You do it. You do it. So it's okay for that. It's okay because eventually, you know, spirituality is everybody is on a different level. It's growth. You know, the, the, the beautiful thing about Judaism is that there's no end to it. There's no end to your growth. We see that the, 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 that the, the one man that achieved the most was what? Moshe Rabbeinu. He got the title of Ish HaElohim. He was half man, half angel. We have, we have human beings that went from this world straight to the next world. They went from human beings to Olam Abba. Human beings to, to, to forms of an angel. How? Because in spirituality, there's no ceiling. There's no end. By the way, if we're talking about prayers, prayers, you're allowed to pray for, uh, for money and you're allowed to pray for health and you're allowed to pray for all these things that a person needs, right? But they said there's times and places where you can pray for it. Now, you can't always pray for money. You can't pray for money uh, on, on Shabbat, for example, right? And then there's certain times that you can uh, deposit prayers about certain things, sometimes that you can't. There's one thing that you're allowed to pray and ask for it for an endless amount. You can't pray for $10 million. If you have $10 million, it's going to change your life to the point where it's going to change you. You don't pray for it. You can pray to have a comfortable life. You can pray to have, you know, uh, uh, 50% more than what you're earning right now, 100% more than what you're earning right now. You can pray like that, something that's normal. But to pray for an exuberant amount, I'll make me a trillionaire. Hashem says, no, 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 no. That's not a good well, prayer. You, you but can pray. The, Oh, sorry. You can pray for 10 million if you say, I want to use nine and a half million for the uh, help of the Jews. And it doesn't so, have to be for you. So here's the thing. Okay. The, one thing the one thing that you can pray for with no limit is spirituality. I you see. can ask for the max. The, the, you can ask more than what you deserve or need in spirituality. That's allowed. As far as for praying for money, it's very sensitive because the, the Gemara talks about money being a curse. Not everybody can, knows how to handle money. You have to be the proper vessel to handle money. That's why it's always good to ask for a little bit more for what you have and gradually get to the 10 million mark. First become a one-time millionaire, then a double millionaire, then a triple millionaire, then 10. Because then you know how to gradually work yourself up to, to, uh, uh, to that level. But to get a big amount of money very quickly, the, they, they say it's not a good thing and you should not, uh, okay. should not pray for that. Yeah, basically you have to stay away from luxury praying. You do. And the point that you made is exactly how you're supposed to pray for money, by the way. When you pray for money, you don't say, Hashem, give me $10 million, point blank. Why? I need it. I want it. It's no. Hashem, give me a million dollars because I'd like to get out of my debt. I'd like to support my uh, wife and give her every, you've given me a duty to, to take care of my uh, of this woman that can give her everything that she needs. You also give me children that should be able to afford Jewish school and kosher food and give them uh, uh, beautiful clothes for the holidays and give them gifts at, their, at the right time and be able to support them to send them to uh, good schools and to Israel to learn and so on and so forth. And then besides all that, that I should also be able to afford a home, a home where I can keep it kosher and I can put mezuzot and I can keep the laws that are connected to the home and, I, and, and give me the beautiful things that are in the house so I can honor the Shabbat and I can honor the... And then also that I should have the ability to take ma'aser from that money and do charity and give, uh, and give money to the needy and do chesed and, 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 and be able to take the surplus of this uh, exorbitant amount of money that I'm asking for in order to make other Jews happy in many different ways. You have to almost like sell God on why you need the money. 
You almost have to let him know, I need it for all these things for myself in order to perform a proper Jewish life. And at the same time, with whatever I'm able to give away, it'll go to, uh, you know, to charity, to special, uh, uh, special acts of kindness and for chesed. And also, I want to make another Jew happy. You know how awesome it feels for, to, to, to have a person that you care for and know that is going through a hard attack and you can give them some money to relieve their stress so they can pay their bills, so they can, you know, uh, not have anxiety about finances. So you ask Hashem, that's what I want to do to another Jew. And he can say, you know what? You don't, you don't seem like a bad partner. Maybe I'll partner up with you. Maybe, I will, maybe you are a proper vessel for this amount of money. And I can do it. I can use you as a partner. I can use you as a vessel for the money to come down into the world and come through you. You've convinced me. Thanks. That's also more money, more problems. And uh, that's not a game of biggie small. Money is, <laughs> money is from the other side. That's the thing. Yes, but you have to use it. Listen, it's part of the world. One last example that I wanted to tell you was... Uh, because it's in this week's parasha, Benot Slofchad. Slofchad was from the tribe of Menashe. What happened to him? How did he die? You know? Hmm. He was the Mekoshesh. He was the one that was picking up the trees on Shabbat. Oh, yes. Okay. Why? Why did he do that? Obviously, he knew. Again, he's one of the greatest generations, right? He saw all the miracles. He saw God. He saw the he, Moshe Rabbeinu. He's in the desert, living on the mount. Why? They're keeping Shabbat. It's one of the first few Shabbatot. Why do you have to go pick up wood? You knew better. And the Gemara says that he was holy. You know why? He killed himself. I don't know if you could say that, but he did, he, he's another version of self-sacrifice. I'm just not sure how, if it's frowned upon or how it's looked on, but I, I read a commentary where they, they saw, it, saw it in a positive light. He, he wanted to show them how important Shabbat is and how, how, how uh, dangerous it is if somebody doesn't keep it to the point of just picking up trees on Shabbat. They was willing to give up his life to teach him a lesson how they must all keep Shabbat. In other words, we see over here that he should have been able to keep Shabbat, no problem. But he chose to be an example for everybody else in order for them to see the greatness of, the, of that day and, the, and what happens that a person can actually die but not keeping that day. In other words, he wants to be the first example of death if you don't keep Shabbat. But th that's in a way suicide. I don't know if that's allowed. It's not allowed. It's not allowed. That's why they don't mention his name. They don't oh, mention they don't mention his name, but uh, the, the commentary and, the, and also the Gemara speaks of it. But just goes to show you that there's, there's a lot of different things that happened in the desert that we say, oh, how, how could you do it? You knew better. I'm sitting here on the couch. I could have done better than you. It's not so simple. It's not so simple. Uh, I think a lot of us are the Gilgal of that generation. We should just merit to be as good as they are. <laughs> or worse, you know? At least. Right. Very good, very good. Okay. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you. Thank you. Really, really enjoyed the lesson. Thank you so much. The Thank you very we're much. Back to, uh, we're going to get back to a few other ones. I think next week we're starting the, the Lunch and Learn again in Aventura, if you guys want to come to it. Um, Wait, are you actually in person? Yeah, yeah, we're going to do it in person. They, I know we have school. We're going back to school. We're, they're opening school, and we're already there preparing us. Really? Yeah. So how be, are you doing it? Yeah. It's going to be Tuesday at 5.30 at Hollandale Beacon, uh, Hollandale Beacon Tower. It's going to be at 5.30. I'll uh, send out the messages on uh, Facebook or on the group. Okay. And, and then we're going to pick up the other series of the prayer. Tefillah 101, we're going to go back into it and maybe add some more installments of, uh, of uh, Mashiach 101. But the Teshuvah season is around the corner. And that's my favorite time of year. To do teshuvah. It's so good to do Teshuvah. Walk into Rosh Hashanah and Kippur to feel forgiven, to feel connected, 
you know, it's a whole different experience when you work on your teshuva 40 days before the big day, or even more than that. Some people start teshuva sabbat tamuz, today they start. Some people start in Tisha B'Av. Some people start in Rosh Chodesh Elul. When you're working on yourself and you're like sitting down and you're telling Hashem, I'm sorry for this, I'm sorry for that. I learned my lesson here. I learned my lesson there. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do that. When you walk into Shul on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, it's a different thing. It's a main event. You're ready for it. And you walk out of Shul, brand new, a baby. You have zero guilt. You know you're forgiven because you did the work. You did the Teshuvah. That's the real thing. That is the real teshuvah. When you walk out of, of, of Yom Kippur and when people ask you, so how was it? And you say, I hope he forgives me. You're doomed. Your teshuvah was worthless. But if you go outside of Yom Kippur and say, it was great, it's going to be a great year. That's because you know that Hashem forgave you for all that you did because he did the proper teshuvah. And we know the formula to that. We'll discuss it in those classes. And you're also ready for the new blessings that Hashem has for you for the year. The new Torah, the new learning, the new experiences. Ah, it's great. It's great. It's all how you prepare for it. Really, so it's exciting. This is your every, oh, no, every sorry. Thursday? Sorry. Oh, sorry. I, just, I just wanted to say with Sharon, like I, came, I went to your classes, you know, the whole Elul and the whole before the Chagim. And I have to say... I used to dread Yom Kippur. I, I really did because I had all this guilt and I, I'm always making a chesh ben nefesh and doing all that, but I always did dread it, like, like this heavy feeling. And then all of a sudden, like in the last couple of years, it has to do with you too. Like I felt like it's the, my favorite day. Like literally it went from being like the worst to the favorites. It's, my it's favorite in the name. Day. Yom Hakipurim, the Day of Atonement. Are you kidding me? Sign me up. It's the best. That's the day we did to get atoned. I mean, I'm tying myself into the title of the, of the day. You know, they gave so me that saying, day. Because like you're sitting there, and I used to like dread it. Like, oh, I have to admit everything I'm doing, and and oh, it's dread. You know, and like I I feel so clean. I feel so happy. Like I feel so. It's like I, I feel so joyous. Like I don't feel sad or anything like that. You know. You know. That, that's, that, that switch flipped for me about a few years ago, and that's why I very much so enjoy the high holidays. It used to be like, okay, it's the day you come, <laughs> you wrestle with yourself to come uh, into shul, you deal with the book of 800 pages in 24 hours, like, how am I going to do this? And then after that, you know, when you when finally get to the part of praying, you're like a deer in headlights. What do I say I'm sorry for? But I also want to ask for what I need. And before you know it, already the, the, the hazan is back on doing the kedusha. And you're like, oh, da, da, and nothing gets accomplished. Nothing gets accomplished. You just like, you, you, you feel like the day runs over you. But if you do your work beforehand, you walk in, you take advantage of each tefillah, each word. You know what happens here. You know what happens there. What's the right thing to do? What's the right, you walk in prepared. It's different. You get your money's worth. Are you doing, are you doing those prayer classes on the Thursday like now? On the, you should uh, join the group. You should join the group where they post all the uh, all the schedule over there, and you'll be able to see the flyers for what's happening. We have them you, posted on the on the Facebook and on the Zoom, and also on YouTube. So for Zoom, how do I get the link? Is that the link I use to get to you now? Yes, but it's, on the groups they tell you the password. Oh, I see. No, I know the password. I got in. Good. Okay. Good. So that's it. it just you, means, I mean, so and it's going to be Thursday every day, right? Every no, no, Thursday. It, it varies, it varies. But for right now, yeah, we, we, you're going to see me next Thursday. Okay. Thanks very much. Okay, no problem. Okay. Thanks, All right, guys. Thank All, you. The best. All the best. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. We'll be in touch. Bye, Josh. Shabbat shalom. Bye. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Thank you for tuning hey, in. Good night, everybody. Shabbat shalom. Shalom. Okay.